Melanie? I want you to go as quietly as possible. Do not make a sound until I tell you to run. Then run as quickly as you can. Now, does everybody understand? Yes, All right, John, you lead the way. Hello, family. I just made it easier for you to learn about Stranger Thinking Media and our uh, product line, products and services. I added to our YouTube channel uh, some links. Uh, this link will get you to the website. This link will get you to Instagram. This one to Facebook. And this one to our Amazon authors page. And from there, you can actually order our products. So it's that simple now. And if you want, you just click on one of the products and it takes you right to the ordering page. So if you want to do some stranger thinking, come on over, hit the links. And remember always to like, subscribe, and we'll see you on the next video. Hello family, we're back at it again, uh, back in the book of Jubilees, um, hoping that everybody's getting us a, a better understanding of uh, how the book of Jubilees can help us in our walk. Um, so let's talk about it. Uh, the book of Jubilees is a book that uh, revolves around a timeline. Um, which is the year of the Jubilee, about a 50-year period. Um, that timeline is used in this book to earmark uh, specific events 
And so there's a lot of good information in it that uh, I thought it worthy that since most people are not familiar with it, that we you know go into it and start doing a little study on it, at least to let you know what's in it. And then, you know, you can judge for yourself whether or not it's worth your time. I think it is. But let's talk about it a little bit. Um, you know, we've done a few videos on it, and uh, hopefully you've all seen the previous videos, so you're not starting from scratch. Uh, if you haven't, you probably need to take a look at it, because a lot of good information in there. But in, a, a, in this particular book, you know, we... Uh, we, we've delved into, you know, the spiritual aspects of it, which to me is the most important thing. You know, I, I know a lot of people think, you know, hey, being, you know, just being a nice person is good enough to get you into the kingdom and all that stuff. Well, there's a lot of nice people, um, but it's all about uh, obedience to the commands of the Most High. So what Jubilees did for me, the thing that caught my eye about it was, you know, you, you often think of, when you think of the law, and you know how you know, some people believe, oh, the law is done away with, you know, that was uh, the, for the Jews, or something like that. Well, it comes to find out that if you read the book of Jubilees, you find out that these laws were in effect long before Israel and the patriarchs understood it and they obeyed it. They knew it. And not only were, and we're going to get into some of this, but not only was the law in effect, um, the, the patriarchs, you know, it, also the laws, laws of oblation, meaning, uh, sacrifice. They understood what to sacrifice, when to sacrifice, how to sacrifice. And it's kind of strange. We, we, we think all that's done away with. Yeah, yeah the laws of oblation were uh, done away with because the, the sacrifice came and went. You know, so that part was done away with. But um, all those sacrificial laws looked forward to fulfilling through Hamashiach, the Messiah, right? So that has happened, right? And I'm saying this assuming there's a lot of Christian listeners out there. But, uh, you know, some, some might argue, I've heard it before, you know, oh, I don't, I don't believe that uh, in Jesus or Yahusha. Well, then you, you have to fall back onto these laws of oblation then. If you want to, you know, continue to go down that path, you still have to fulfill that covering and that's what the blood of lambs and goats did it covered your sin whereas Hamashiach took away invoking the blood of Hamashiach takes away the sin so these sacrifices were just a shadow of something greater to come but anyway I didn't want to get too far into that so much but I do want you to understand that all these things were in effect way before Moses they were in effect before Abram. You know, they were in effect before Noah. Adam, I mean, start reading that book. You'll see that Adam sacrificed. And they, they took specific days and times to do this. So once you look at things like um, the holy days, and I don't mean holidays, I mean holy days, these appointed times, their appointments, you'll see that Noah, was well aware of it and we're going to do a couple of videos I well, might do a lot of videos on that because Jubilees is about kind of about times you know, organizing even the calendar the, the calendars we use today are just off kilter you know so they have God's calendar was uh, specked out in Jubilees and uh, you know how we do BC and AD as far as time references, millennial time references, well, you know, they that's pretty much taken care of too. I mean, there's just so much information that you can get out of Jubilee. So I recommend highly that you, you look into it. 
So we've been focusing on the uh, spirit world, specifically the on the you know the demonic side, where the demons come from. Well, they're the disembodied Nephilim, and who are the Nephilim? Well, they are the children of the Watcher angels, who procreated with human women. And of course, when the flood came, and God sent, make no, make no mistake, God sent that flood to destroy that seed, the serpent seed. They were too powerful, too powerful for men. So he sent that flood to destroy them. But when they got destroyed, their spirits endured and they roam the earth today and we know them as demons, right? So uh, I'm trying to make everybody aware of what they're actually fighting against. So in the last couple of videos, we saw that we fight not against flesh and blood, but against spiritual wickedness in high places, against principalities of the darkness. So uh, today I'm going to kind of show how a man can do battle against these entities. And it's real. So don't think that, you know, if the guy next door to you is acting up, you don't think it's the guy next door to you acted up. It's something affecting him. And once you start realizing these things, I mean, and, and, and it's not just a one time thing. Sometimes those things attach themselves to your personalities. And we all have to deal with it. It's not just one guy is holy and he doesn't have to deal with it. No, we're all dealing with it. So you need to know how to deal with it. So I'm going to show you how one man, one man, was able to go head to head with it and we can see how he used how he was able to overcome it and he's no greater than any one of you you all have the ability to overcome these entities um, but there are requirements you saw how uh, when he when Yahusha Jesus was attempt when he was tempted on the mountaintop how he overcame it he's giving you the blueprint so in Jubilees, I'm going to introduce you to uh, Abraham, or, or Ab Abram. Remember, at this point, you know, they're all Hebrews, but they're kind of, I don't want to use the term Gentiles, but let's just say this. They are in uncircumcision. And while in uncircumcision, they're obeying the commandments of God, or the commandments of Yahweh Elohim. Uh, so Abraham's a good, or Abram, I'm like, I gotta, I'm going to call him by the name he's called at this point. So Abram is, uh, up against some, some stuff and essentially he's taking on the chief, the chief of the demons that, that doesn't mean he's a demon, you know, as a matter of fact, he's an angel, but he's a chief of the demons. And he's called in the Book of Jubilees, he's called Mastema. And we introduced Mastema before. So let's see how Abraham kind of deals, just a mortal man, how he's able to control the situation. Not him, but the Holy Spirit working through him. It's a power, and you got to invoke it. You have to invoke that power. So uh, we're going to... Uh, start the, uh, the little lesson here. Um, and we are all the way on the wrong side of this. Okay, we're going to start with Mark chapter 4, verse 3 through 9. And uh, so this is a parable. Uh, Hearken, behold, there went out a sower to sow. And it came to pass as he sowed, some fell by the wayside, and the fowls of the air came and devoured it up. And some fell on stony ground where it had not much earth. And immediately it sprang up because it had no depth of earth. 
But when the sun was up, it was scorched, and because it had no root, it withered away. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no fruit. And another fell on good ground and did yield fruit that sprang up and increased and brought forth some thirty and some sixty and some an hundred. And he said unto them, He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. So the key to this parable, of course, Jesus is is speaking to to people, his disciples are out there with him amongst them. And he starts off by saying, Behold, there went out a sower to sow. And it came to pass, as he sowed, some fell by the wayside, and the fowls of the air came and devoured it up. Now, I'm going to focus on that line. That kind of goes into our story. These fowls of the air, you know, they mean something. They're symbolic of something. And you'll find throughout the entire scriptures, when they start talking about eagles or the fowls of the air, they're generally talking about a certain thing uh, that we we see it here on earth in a certain way. But um, these birds are symbolic of a couple things, you know. Um, so that's going to lead us into uh, what I want to talk about out of Jubilees. We, we want to discover what these, kind of what these fowls of the air represent. So uh, let's go into Jubilees. And we're going to, we're going to, now we're going back in time into Jubilees. So bear with me. <laughs> And in the 35th Jubilee, in the third week, in the first year, and as you see in parentheses, it says 168 a.m. In other words, uh, I forget what a.m. means. It means anus, anus something. But it's basically counting from year, z- year zero, basically from essentially the birth of uh, Adam. So this is 168 years in. Um, thereof, Rude took himself a wife, and her name was Orda, the daughter of Ur, the son of Kesed. And she bare him a son, and he called his name Sero, in the seventh year of this week, in this jubilee. Um, in this jubilee 16, or was year 1687. Yeah, I, I missed the, missed that first one. I said six uh, 168 is actually 1681. And now we're in the year 1687 that this occurs. And the sons of Noah began to war on each other, to take captive and to slay each other, and to shed the blood of men on the earth, and to eat blood, and to build strong cities and walls and towers. And individuals began to exalt themselves above the nation. Okay, so individual men started going, hey, I'm the best of the best. I'm the king. So kings started to come about. And to found the beginnings of kingdoms and to go to war. People against people and uh, nation against nation and city against city. And all began to do evil and to acquire arms and to teach their sons war. And they began to capture cities and to sell uh, male and female slaves. So basically, you know, if you remember uh, the story, or if you know the story, um, one of the fallen watchers, his name was Azazel, uh, and he was the one that the Most High Yah was most angry with and gave him a severe punish because it was he that taught mankind had to basically war and kill each other, you know. And that, and, and Yah knew that would be the worst. So he, Azazel got the worst punishment. But as you can see, now this, all these seeds that were sown by the watchers are now coming to fruition. And so now human beings are now, you know, whacking each other. Uh, 
So now, now remember we're in Ur of the Chaldees. When you see Kesed, Kesed means the, essentially uh, Kesed is a is a name of a man, but he's the progenitor of the Chaldeans, and so he built a city that he called Ur. Uh, so, and Ur, the son of Kesed, built the city of Ara of the Chaldees and called its name after his own name and the name of his father. So if you remember, Abram came out of Ur of the Chaldees. He was a brand plucked out of the fire. And there's a reason they called him a brand plucked out of the fire. And you have to read Jubilees and Jasher to start getting an understanding of what that means. Let's put it this way. Daniel was not the first to be thrown into a fiery furnace. And they made for themselves molten images and they worshipped each the idol, the molten image which they had made for themselves. And they began to make graven images and unclean simulacra. I know that word. If you ever watched The Matrix, the book that Neo was reading was, I think it was called Simulation and Simulacra or something like that. Um, and malignant spirits assisted and seduced them into committing transgression and uncleanness, uncleanness. So that's the power of these spirits, right? They really, what power do they have other than to get in your head and talk you into self-destructive action or self-destructive thoughts, which, you know, that root of bitterness can spring up and, and that thought can become an action. So don't entertain these things. And I say entertain these things. Think about the old, uh, you know, the old uh, vampire storyline where if you think about it, in the old myth, a vampire, he couldn't just come in your house. He had to knock on your door and ask if he could come in. And of course, you had the choice to say no and slam the door in his face and he could not come in. But of course... These vampires would come in a, in, in assorted uh, uh, vis, visage, visages. You know, they'd look a certain way. <laughs> and so if a really beautiful vampire walked up to your door and said, hey, can I come in? You know, a lot of guys would be like, sure. You know, so, but it's always in your hand to say no. And I, I want to emphasize that, that you have the ability to command and most people don't. They watch these movies. And of course, these movies are put out by Satan, the devil himself, and his henchmen, showing the, that these demons have all this power. Yeah, they do if you play their game. But you have power. And you have the ultimate power. Like I said, Jesus told the devil to get hence, and the devil had to leave. He had to. Had to go. You have that power. You just don't know how to use it. And like I say, they know your weakness. They can't read your mind, but they can read your actions to figure out what's in your mind. And if they, if they know you have a certain weakness, whether you spoke it, that's why they say, be careful what you say. You might speak it into existence. Yeah, you might speak it into existence because they're listening to you. And they said, well, th he's, he has a weakness here. Let's put that in front of him, you know. So they're listening to what you say, so be careful what you say. You know, um, a city without walls. A, a man who can't rule the spirit is like a city without walls. We talked about that. So, like I said, be careful. Uh, bridle your tongue. Okay, so these uh, demons were able to, uh, you know, seduce that's the key word, seduce men into committing transgression and uncleanness. And as an old tactic, in a way, when it pertained to Israel, they called it the era of Balaam. And that's, that's another story we'll get into it sometime. But if you can keep the people in uncleanness and sin, then the Most High, he, he can't coexist with that. So... If the people sin, then the Most High has to step away from it. He does not mix with uncleanness. He does not 
light does not mix with darkness. You know, it doesn't happen that way. You know, so, and that's why the priest, the Le Levitical priests, had to go through such cleaning rituals. You know, they had to they had to create essentially a clean room for the Most High to be able to commune with them, to come down and actually talk with them. And I don't think we understand that, you know. So when you pray, you make yourself clean before you pray. And, and we could get into that at another time, you know. But the, the, we, Yahusha gave us the prototype or the template for how to pray. And there's a reason. He says, forgive us our trespasses or forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation. But there's a portion of that prayer where you, are, you have to create your clean space, right? And, and you have to invoke the, the blood of the Hamashiach. Unless, of course, you're killing goats and bulls, then you have to go through the whole, you know, physical, carnal, you know, uh, sacrificial aspect of things, you know. I, that's that's very difficult, right? And it's it's one of those things that Yah says uh, was ready to pass away. And it was ready to pass away because you don't have to do it anymore because you have, you invoke the blood of the true sacrifice, Yahusha, Hamashiach, Jesus the Christ, right? So anyways, let's continue. We see uh, uh, man is going off on a tangent. And let's see what happens then. So, we're going to skip down a little bit. Um, Jubilees 11 and 5. And the Prince Mastema, there's that guy, exerted himself to do all this. So he's pulling the strings here. And he sent forth other spirits, those which were put under his hand. You know, that 10%, the 90% got cast into Sheol, or Tarturos, or Hades, whatever you want to call it. But 10% are left under his command to do all manner of wrong and sin and all manner of transgression, to, to corrupt and destroy and to shed blood upon the earth. For this reason, he called the name of Sero, Serug. And that name should be familiar. For everyone turned to do all manner of sin and transgression. So here's Mestema, um, just uh, jumping in, taking command, and uh, doing what he does. So uh, we're about to see Abraham do battle. Uh, but before we do that, I'm going to uh, show a little video. And uh, hopefully um, you can uh, glean some good information out of it. And then we'll come back to the to the slides. So hang in there. Mastama sends a plague of birds onto the land in the days of Terah, Jubilees eleven ten. They would be the death birds. Later, Mastama counsels God to test Abraham, Jubilees 17, 15, 16, as does Satan in the book of Job, who wanted approval to test Job. As Abraham prepares to sacrifice his son Isaac, Mastama stands in God's presence. On his deathbed, Isaac promises that the spirits of Mastama will have no power to turn Jacob or his descendants away from Yahweh. Okay, family, hopefully uh, you got to see and understand a little bit about uh, what Abraham was up against. Uh, he's going to continually through his life do battle with Mestima. And uh, Mestima is focused on him. And you'll see the brighter your light shines, the more of a target you become. And so, just like Israel, you now start, in order to survive, your choices are you capitulate and give in to him, then he'll kind of leave you alone. He'll, he'll probably reward you. And a lot of 
what I like to call Luciferians, you know, whatever, whether it's an organized religion or not, it's just a principle that he, Mestema, the, the devil, if you will, will seek out people who are potentially dangerous and make them offers to try to sway them. I mean, it's basically bribery. It's an old tactic. So, hey, this guy's got his act together. Um, let's make him an offer, see if he'll join us. And, of course, Jesus was a perfect example. He was so righteous that, I mean, every demon, every foul bird, if you want to call it, um, they saw this light and said, oh, my goodness, we've never seen anything like this before. And, of course, the chief Mastema says, don't worry about it, guys. We'll go down there and we'll we'll do them like we did Adam. We'll offer him something great because this is no ordinary one. This one we're going to have to give. We're going to have to give him the house. <laughs> we're going to have to offer him everything to sway this one. But if we can sway this one, we'll have our guy. This, this guy is that powerful. We'll have our guy. And, of course, he goes down. And, of course, you know, Yahusha, Jesus, basically tells him to pound sand. Get the heck out of here. And so in that first, uh, I'm not going to call it the first meeting necessarily, but the first meeting of note to where they wrote it down, um, Yahushua showed extreme resistance to the to his evil. And of course, if once you understand the principle, the principle is this. You'll get an offer. If you choose it, now you become his servant. And that's great. He'll he'll. He'll bless you with riches and power and all sorts of stuff. But if you go against him after he's made you that offer, what will happen then is now you've chosen a side. And so if you turn him down at that point, you must fall under the Most High. You, you have to because at that point, he's going to try to destroy you because he can't have a counter uh, uh you know, philosophy. He, he's not going to allow you to continue. So he's going to come after you. And the only defense you have is what the Most High Yahweh Elohim provides to you. The Most High is the only weapon against this onslaught. And so, as you can see, Abraham was well aware of it. Yahushua, Jesus, was well aware of it. And so when these forces start coming against them, they invoke the power of the Most High. And that's more than sufficient. But you have to stay under that protection. As you see, with the, the nation of Israel is while they were under, while they were keeping Yah's commands, his laws, statutes, and commandments, that he like he told him in Deuteronomy, you will be the head of all nations. But if you don't, then I can't protect you. And I'm gonna allow I'm gonna back off. You have to stay clean to be in a relationship with me. And and, and again, no man is perfect. That's why you have that oblation. And and today we understand. At least if you're a Christian, you understand that that oblation now falls under the blood of Yahushua, Jesus, right? So you have to stay clean. If if you're not praying every day, Father, cleanse me with the blood of, by the blood of Yahushua or Jesus. Now you're dirty. <laughs> and those things now, they know that, okay, he's put up a wall between him and Yah. Let's get him. He, it's a constant thing. You have to constantly... You know, if you commit some transgression, you have to cleanse yourself, get clean, stay in relationship through prayer and fasting. Because some things like Jesus said, Yahushua said, some demons don't go out except by prayer and fasting. So for those who never fast, yeah, you might have gotten rid of some of the bad ones. But the really bad ones... 
are still with you. You know what I'm saying? So fasting is, is an important thing. And that's why, and we won't go into detail right now, but that's why there's an annual fast, a commanded fast, basically, or an affliction of your soul. And uh, today they call it Yom Kippur, but uh, anciently is basically known as the Day of Atonement so that you can get rid of that sin so that you can have a right relationship with the Most High. So I like to call it the Day of at one mint. Okay? But it shouldn't come down to just one day. It's, it's, it's a continual thing because these entities are continually trying to find a way to destroy you. And once they get in, then they keep you from praying. Then they keep you from asking for forgiveness. Then all of a sudden there's a wall between you and the Most High. Now they can just and go, you know, go at it. And by the time you look up, you are so far away from the Most High. I mean, you can find yourself in jail or something. I, I'm just telling you how fast things can go south unless you maintain that relationship with the Most High. Okay, so we, we saw the video. Um, we saw how what Mass Stemma's new plan is. And so uh, we're going to actually talk about it a little bit here. Um, let's go to the next slide. And we're in Jubilees 11 and 11. And the Prince Mastama sent ravens and birds to devour the seed which was sown in the land. Again, let's harken back to the parable of Yahusha, Jesus, where he said, some seed fell by the wayside. And straightway, the, the fowls of the air came and snatched them up. So what are these fowls of the air symbolic of? What are they? They're demonic forces. They're carrion birds. They're ravens, you know. So here in the time of Abraham, in the era of the Chaldees, there was a problem. All of a sudden, these ravens, uh, they were being swarmed. The, the people were being swarmed by ravens who were eating up all their seeds. So when they planted, before they could even plow it into the ground, these clouds of ravens would come and eat up their seed. So the disaster was looming. Okay, so the Prince Mastema sent ravens and birds to devour the seed which was sown in the land in order to destroy the land and rob the children of men of their labors. Before they could plow in the seed, the ravens picked it up from the surface of the ground. So the seeds were never allowed to gain root. And so on a, on a larger note, it's like believers, before they can wean themselves off of just milk and get into the eating meat, scriptural meat, the ravens come down and snatch them up before they can take root, you know, and I mean deep root to where the ravens go, oh, that one's going to be too hard. Let me leave that one alone. And for this reason, he called his name Terra because the ravens and the birds reduced them to destitution and devoured their seed. Terra, you know that name. Uh, let's continue. And the years began to be barren, owing to the birds. And it devoured all the fruit of the trees from the trees. It was only with great effort that they could save a little of all the fruit of the earth in their days. And that's kind of like where we're at now. Um, it's being hard. People are starting to fall away so far. And even people who start down the path, there is not necessarily all the time they get seduced to the point where they just say, they're, you know, I'm an atheist now. Forget about God. It's usually more subtle. And yeah, serpent is subtle. He doesn't, he doesn't come at you with, Generally speaking, he doesn't say God is a liar. He, he he's more like this. He's, yeah, yeah, God said that. But look at it from this perspective, you know. And he'll he he'll use like like they said in Babylon, they used brick for stone, right? 
A brick is a man-made stone instead of using the God-made stone. And we know the stone is Yahusha, Jesus, right? They use a brick that's the foundation, the building block. A man-made Yahusha, essentially, you know, a man-made stone. And that's going to be the foundation of these two systems. One is a man-made uh, mimicry or mockery of the God-made version. And keep that in mind. There are two systems at work. Babylon doesn't say there's no God. Babylon doesn't say there's no Messiah. Babylon doesn't say there wasn't a virgin birth. What Babylon does, it twists everything. They flip the script on God's, you know, storyline, right? They're not trying to tell people that these angelic forces want to be God. So they go, hey, let's make our own story. We'll, we'll, we'll see how God was going to write this thing out. And let's just take it and direct it to us. And so you get into these uh, circumstances where people talk about, you know, instead of Passover, everybody's observing Easter, which is a Babylonian tradition. I mean, we we can go all into that. I know a lot of people will get like, it'll be two outcomes. You'll either get offended by it or, um, well, more than two outcomes, but you could be offended by it. Hey, you're trying to take away my religion. But for those who are seeking truth, let's see, what is the truth? And it's not a hidden truth. It's fact. It's just understood. Everybody knows that, you know, a lot of customs are Babylonian traditions that we we kind of have internalized today. And that's not by accident. It is not by accident. And if, if that becomes your worldview, then cognitive dissonance sets in where in order to change, you would have to, in order to believe this other thing, you would have to change your entire worldview. You would have to, you know, maybe even leave your friends or your, or your churches or your organizations. I'm not telling anybody to do that. But what I am saying is, don't deny truth, because if you you can stomp truth into the ground, but like the dust, it will always rise. You cannot destroy truth. Truth will win in the end. So if you turn your back on truth through cognitive dissonance, it's going to come back and bite you in the you know where so at least understand you know and we're gonna we're gonna delve into some of this stuff really you know deeply down the road but just understand these like appointed times and i'm just using this as an example these appointed times are real things happen on these days Yahushua was crucified on Passover, right? The Holy Spirit was given on Pentecost. These things are appointments. He's telling you, I'm going to do this thing on this day. It might not be this year. It might be 100 years from now on this day. But it's going to happen on that day. And if we just sit back and just honestly look at, oh, so let's see, Jesus was, Killed a Passover lamb was killed on Passover. Hmm, interesting. He, Jesus ascended into heaven. That's why it's important to understand. Put yourself in a Hebrew mindset because he ascended into the heaven on the day that the high priest would lift the wave loaves bread up to heaven as a part of the ceremony. And whether they understood or not what that was symbolic of, because Yahushua is the bread of life. And the priests on that day would lift up two loaves up to heaven. And that's the day Yahushua ascended into heaven. Are you, are you picking up what I'm putting down? You can operate under, you know, you could be like, hey, I don't want to hear it. I'm going to keep doing what I've been doing. Well, go ahead, keep doing what you've been doing, but understand the principle. Yahushua was crucified on Passover. He ascended into heaven the day the, the high priest lifts the wave loaves up to heaven. The Holy Spirit was given on the day of Pentecost. And then there's a gap. 
It's like a three-month gap, right? Just like now. It's been 2,000 years since Christ. It's a gap. But what's in the... So we when you leave the, the, the spring holy days, and then there's a gap, then come the fall holy days. And of course, all that's tied to their... Uh, you know, their their uh, agricultural cycles and their harvests. But what's the first holy day in the fall? And we're going to go into that one. It's not today, but it's trumpets. Well, that should be a hint. So after the big gap, in our case, the 2,000 years, what's the next holy day to be fulfilled? The day of the trumpets. So anyway... I, I didn't mean to get off on a tangent like that. Um, and it might have confused you a little bit. So don't worry about that for now. We'll get into it. Um, let's get back to Jubilees. So the years became barren. People started starving because the birds are eating up all the seeds. Now nothing's growing. And only with great labor were they able to get anything out of it. Let's continue. And the seed time came for the sowing of seed upon the land, and they all went forth together to protect their seed against the ravens. And Abram went forth with those that went, and the child was a lad of 14 years old. So Abraham's 14 years old. And a cloud of ravens came to devour the seed. And Abram ran to meet them. Sounds like King David. Remember, he ran to meet Goliath. There was no, he didn't hesitate. He knew exactly. That means the faith in him was undeniable. He knew what he, he knew what needed to be done. He knew how to do it. So Abram ran to meet them before they settled on the ground and cried to them before they settled on the ground to devour the seed and said, descend not. He commanded them. He commanded them. You can command them. Yes. Return to the place when she came. Uh, that just reminds me of, uh, you remember Gandalf on the, on the Bridget Kassad Doom, for, for, for you who are J.R.R. Tolkien fans. He said, uh, go back to the shadow when he talked to the Balrog, right? That, that ancient demon, the Balrog, he said, go back to the shadow. So here's Abraham doing the same thing. Return to the place when she came. And they proceeded to turn back. And he caused the clouds of ravens to turn back that day 70 times. 70 is a very important number. The Bible interprets itself. 70 means something. 70. He caused them to turn back 70 times. And of all the ravens throughout all the land where Abraham was, they're settled. They're not not so much as one. Where, where Abraham was, the, he was, it was like a force field around him. They got the heck out of there. See, believers, you can so shine a light that even the demonic forces don't want to, at, at a certain point, they don't want to have anything to do with you. They, they'll leave it up to the big dogs in their, in their, in their kingdom or outfit to deal with you. But average Joe Demon, he's not going to, he's, he's done. He's out of there. Unless you slip up, then he goes, my house, my house is all swept and clean. I'm coming back. And all who were with him throughout all the land saw him cry out, and all the ravens turned back. And his name became great in all the land of the Chaldees. Wow. So Abraham becomes famous. You know? God made him great in the eyes of the other nations. And that's why we, know, we remember him to this day. And the same with Moses. If you think about it, Moses was a prince in the land of Egypt. He was living large. He had all, the, all those you know, fun things you could do when you're rich you know, and a prince. And had he done that, he would have been just a footnote, maybe, maybe in history. I mean, do we even know the princes of, of the pharaohs at this point? We may know the pharaohs' names, but we don't even know their princes' names. But he chose essentially poverty and exile. 
And because he did that, to this day, we talk about Moses. And for you believers, understand that. Your imprint is not going to be based on how much money you make or the position you have in this world. It's choosing the correct way. And so we remember Moses, a man who left the, the riches of Egypt to herd sheep in the desert. And without TikTok and without uh, Facebook and all this other stuff, that name is known all around the earth and revered. So think that through for a minute. So going back to Mark, um, so of course, you know, in the beginning we talked about the parable of Yahushua and the seeds, but now he's alone with his disciples and they're confused. <laughs> you know, like, and when he was alone, they that were about him with the twelve asked of him the parable. And he said unto them, unto you it is given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God. But unto them that are without, all these things are done in parables. So, right there, I remember, uh, you know, um, I was in uh, Sunday school, and, uh, you know, somebody asked, why did Jesus speak in parables? And I remember the answer um, came back, I think it was from the nun, she said, uh, Oh, Jesus spoke in parables to make his meaning more clear. No, he didn't. He was speaking in code. It was encrypted language. Only his believers could understand what he was saying. And he, he did that because he had enemies out there that were looking for ways to trap him. So sometimes he was only trying to get his point across to people he knew would get it. And the fact that you get it means you are somebody who probably studies in it. And the reason you study is probably because you have God's spirit. I mean, there's, there's ways to look at it, but he spoke in parables to hide the meeting to the outsiders where his insiders could still understand what he was saying. So he's speaking in code. All right. That seeing they may see and not perceive and hearing they may hear and not understand, lest at any time they should be converted and their sins should be forgiven them. And he said unto them, Know ye not this parable? Because even sometimes the disciples would have problems picking it up. You know, it happens. And how then will ye know all parables? The sower soweth the word. That's, that's kind of what I'm doing right now. I'm sowing the word. And these are they by the wayside, where the word is sown, but when they have heard, Satan cometh immediately and taketh away the word that was sown in their hearts. And uh, it's best, that happens a lot. That's where we are now. So, you know, I want to kind of end it on that, but just understand I don't ever ask people to change anything, you know. Um, your faith is your key to salvation. And, and and let's be clear, salvation means something. Most people don't understand what that means. When you say you are saved, saved from what? Do you really understand what that means? Yeah, we'll go into that at some point. I'm making all these promises, but... I shouldn't say promises. Only God can make a promise, right? Excuse me. Only Yah can make a promise. I can give you my word. And my word is I will do some videos uh, getting into these uh, doctrines a little bit. But anyway, family, uh, on that note, um, you know, hope, hopefully you've been edified. Um, but study the truth. I mean, you can study it where you're at. Meaning, if you're in a church, I'm not telling you to leave your church or whatever. But what you will find, though, is the more truth you start adhering to, it may make it more difficult to stay where you're at. And then you, 
and then it's no longer cognitive dissonance. When you get to a certain point in truth, you may just want to leave because you won't be able to swallow things that are not truth, you know. And that's not to take anything away from anybody out there, you know, who sees things differently. But ultimately, you'll start to find that the more you start to understand, the harder it will be to go back to something that you know is not right. You'll you'll see what I'm talking about. But first comes learning. And that's how you know you're going you're being led by the spirit and not some organization and not some man um, is that you will start to see for yourself. You won't be dependent on somebody else. That somebody else was there as your schoolmaster feeding you milk. But there's a point in time where you've been, Paul said it, <laughs> man, y'all been drinking milk for like a long, like, I mean, you're the biggest babies I've ever seen. You've been drinking milk. And you're 30 years old, still drinking milk, <laughs> you know. It's time to eat meat, you know. I'll leave you with this, though. Like I said, the Book of Jubilees is a timeline, and I hear people, you know, they've been quoting grace, 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 grace. And yes, we've had 2,000 years of grace, but the Jubilee timeline, and I have to do a video on that, tells you that grace ends at a specific time point in time in history in jubilee and i i, I gotta tell you that kind of happens this century when you're tracking these things this century grace ends and what comes after grace when grace ends judgment there's no more oh forgive me i no you've had two thousand years to get it together and, and my messiah says in the book of the Revelation is that basically this time was so he wanted to make sure you know you could keep destroying people but give you a period of time where more people can enter into the kingdom you know give them time give them grace get it together but what a lot of people have done is turn grace into license to the point where they're saying the law is done away with now come on people Come on. To say the law is done away with is the same as saying gravity is done away with. Yet, I don't see you floating off into space. To say the same that the law of thermodynamics is gone, it's been done away with. Laws, laws are, the reason they're called laws, really, and I'm talking from a, a, a spiritual perspective, is because they're immutable. These laws are there, and they're there forever. You will not, he tells you, the, almost like the last chapter in the, <laughs> the last chapter, like I think it's the last verse in the Revelation, Jesus Christ says, you know, and these are without the gates. And he lists, you know, fornicators and, and, and ad adulterers and, and, you know what I'm saying, covetous. He's saying these you cannot enter into the kingdom doing these things. I, I mean, he makes it plain, and, and he does it at the very end, like, just so you can't say, well, that was in the beginning. That I, No, he's telling you, you cannot enter the kingdom doing these things because the people in the kingdom won't be doing these things. I mean, do I, does someone have to hit you over the head with a hammer to get that? The law is not done away with. Through grace, that grace time period, the consequences of the law, spiritually, and I don't mean physically, because if you run a stop sign, you may still get hit by that tractor trailer, but spiritually, you, it won't be, as long as you invoke the blood of the Messiah, it won't be held against you. doesn't mean you can do whatever you want. You you can commit adultery, and there won't be physical consequences here on earth. And then you might be able to do it and get away with it on earth. Like you keep running a stop sign and get lucky or whatever and not get hit by the tractor trailer. 
But if you keep doing it, then spiritually there's a consequence to it in the end because you, you're habitually doing it. You haven't repented, and then it will be held against you, right? So that being said, uh, ya bless, hallelujah, uh, and, and may, may ya cause his face to shine upon you. And we'll see you for the next video, family. Thank you very much.